Hey there, everybody. Settle in. Maybe brew one of our premium organic fair trade native roasted blends like Unf Your Morning and get ready because we have a meaty topic ahead of us. The concept of modern monetary theory or MMT. MMT has critics on the left, the right, the middle, pretty much all around. But we've been operating under a version of it since the Reagan administration. We took a brief hiatus under Bill Clinton, but it's been a guiding principle for the past quarter century, to be sure. UNFTR. Whether you know it or not, we did a little groundwork on this episode already in our Bretton Woods video. Check it out if you haven't had a chance. Among the innovations that came out of the conference was the end of the physical gold standard, which proved to be too limiting of a monetary policy in the era of extreme growth, industrialization, and of course, militarization of the world. But it's important to know that gold remained the underpinning of value and continued to guide how we thought about monetary policy and the value of currency in general. So here's the moment that our thinking should have changed. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. When Nixon pulled us off the gold standard and allowed currency to float, he essentially unshackled money and set big governments free to expand. The immediate aftermath was pure chaos as he compounded this incredible moment by adding punitive tariffs on imports and sent the world scrambling to align with the new economic order prescribed by the United States. It's one of the primary reasons the global economy went off the rails in the 1970s, only to be exacerbated by the dual oil shocks in the Middle East. Understanding the mindset of a limited currency is important. It's important to understanding MMT and budgets in general. The other critical component is the federal budget. The whole concept of running a massive deficit is totally new, and I can't stress this enough. There are so many out there who are genuinely concerned about the size of the U.S. national debt, and I hear you. We also covered that in our debt ceiling crisis. What's important, though, is that balancing the federal budget was seen as sacrosanct in peacetime eras. The only time our nation's leaders strayed was during times of war, and even then, running a deficit was considered a last resort. Okay, so what is MMT? Essentially, MMT is the idea that any large, stable government that issues its own currency can run extraordinary deficits to finance basically anything without fear of negative monetary or fiscal consequences. Now, to wrap your head around MMT, you almost have to unlearn everything that we've ever been told about monetary theory, balanced budgets, national debt, and budget deficits. Everything that you know about money and how the government operates. Here are four classic but false narratives. One, balance the budget. Conventional theory says the government should operate like a household. But first off, most households utilize credit for major purchases, so there's that. And your household can go bankrupt. The US government cannot. Two, tax the rich. So the theory goes that if you tax the wealthy, it stifles growth, investment, and incentives. The highest period, though, of consistent and equitable economic growth in the nation was in the post-World War II era through the 1970s, when the top tax rate was 90% and the marginal rate was more than 50%. But also, and you're not going to like this, it doesn't matter whether we tax the rich. And I'll get into that later. Number three, spending equals inflation. So again, the idea is that too much stimulus spending will overheat the economy and lead to hyperinflation. That has happened in other countries and around the world, but you've got to be clear about this. We run extravagant deficits to fund the military industrial complex. We have for years, for decades, to build and rebuild infrastructure. We provide tax breaks for wealthy Americans, which is a form of stimulus. Even a massive infrastructure spending bill, like the bill that we have under Biden, these things don't impact inflation. We can talk about the causes of inflation both now and throughout history, but it's been proven time and again that running budget deficits has zero correlation with inflation. Number four, mortgaging the future. So you've heard this before and it's a popular sentiment and again, I totally get it. We're saddling our children and our grandchildren with debt. That's literally everyone on every news channel ever. And we are, but also we're not. And this is where we get into the heart of MMT. 
As I've mentioned before, on the podcast, we take great care to thoroughly vet and display our sources, and we want to do that here as well. So our book love segment today goes to The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton. She's sort of the spiritual leader of the MMT movement right now, and in large part because of this book. It's smart and accessible, and it offers readers a solid entry point into macroeconomics. What I appreciate the most about it is how she skillfully breaks down each convention by making them relatable and placing them in context. So let's go back to the big myths. The first is the household myth. Run the government like a house. Well, for starters, this would be a really strange house because you'd be spending more on home security and weapons than you would on food, healthcare, education, retirement, your mortgage, everything. Okay, so maybe that is your house if you're in a militia, but most of us don't live this way. If a household spends more than it earns, it has to take on debt, something that plagues most Americans. In fact, the average household debt in the United States is upward of $90,000, including mortgages, credit cards, and student loans, and 35% don't own a home. Between half and three quarters of a million Americans file bankruptcy every year as a result of their debt burden. So when a household gets over its skis and can't pay its debt, it goes bankrupt. Boom. Done. But the U.S. government never seems to. For decades, we've been running huge deficits, especially during and since the pandemic. And guess what? Investors still purchased our treasuries. Inflation increased in the past 18 months due to a combination of corporate greed, latent issues stemming from supply chain shocks, and a rapid surge in raw agricultural materials from the war in Ukraine. But we haven't experienced hyperinflation in the way some other countries have, and we're not burning $20 bills to heat our homes. Why? Because the United States isn't a household. Now, some people will point to crises in other countries as a danger in running up massive debts and deficits. Recall the Greek debt crisis is one of the most popular examples of this. But the one difference between us and the Greeks, aside from Souvlaki and the fact that they have Yanis Varoufakis, who's the coolest, is the ability to print more money. When Greece dropped the drachma and joined the EU currency family, it lost the ability to control the amount of money in circulation, and it was subsequently subjected to austerity measures from European central banks that only worsened the situation. To clarify the household example, Kelton takes great pains to explain the difference between being a currency user and a currency issuer. You, me, your home, your business, even local and state governments in the United States, we're all currency users. We can't print money when we take on too much debt and lose the ability to service it and go broke. But the federal government can, and it does. So why doesn't every country do it? Well, that's another story and we'll get there in a moment. But for our purposes right now, the governments in control of their own currencies that are big enough and stable enough to manage massive deficits are the United States, Japan, the UK, Australia, and Canada. These are the largest and most notable, with the U.S. leading the pack as 90% of all global transactions are settled in U.S. dollars, and we'll get there too. So let's talk about money. What is money anyway? If certain countries can just make it up, it's a really good question. Money is a way to settle an obligation, first and foremost. Goods, services, gasoline, whatever. We all need it to get by in the world. A government that prints its own money, on the other hand, doesn't really need to settle obligations with anyone in this specific way. It seems like it does because it taxes us for what it calls revenue, but think about the order of things for a second. If money in the form of taxes was required for the government to do things, it would need it before, not after, it does a thing. Now, I know this sounds weird, but follow me for a second. If the government builds a highway or a tanker or a space program, it doesn't ask you for the money first, it spends the money. Then it refills these imaginary coffers by taking the money back from you, but it's not like they ever take the full dollar amount, dollar for dollar. And they didn't need your money to build these things in the first place because they print the money. So it's really about what that money is worth. In theory, as long as money holds its value and the value of it is accepted, like milk costs X and everybody knows it and cocaine costs Y, and that's a right, bad example, but you know what I'm saying then you can use this money to settle an obligation. The value of a government good or service, or even something that you buy or rent in your own life, isn't dependent upon whether the government has a deficit or a surplus. They're completely disconnected. 
So it's about the intrinsic value of this money and our collective belief in its purchasing power. The real price of something in the economy is determined by the value we place on it and the availability of it and the agreed upon settlement value. State and local governments are currency users like the rest of us and must therefore follow household rules of balanced budgets. Countries that gave up their sovereign currencies, like the ones in the EU or others that lack the intrinsic financial wherewithal to settle obligations with security, aren't as fortunate. So the next logical question, if you live in a sovereign currency nation like Canada, Japan, the United States, why do we even pay taxes at all? Well, the answer from a federal perspective is that you really don't. All right, I'm not saying everybody should just stop paying their taxes. And remember, I'm also not talking about property taxes, sales tax, park and recreation fees, the taxes that all of us have to pay to make everything run locally and statewide. I'm talking about the federal income tax and deductions like Social Security. The federal government technically doesn't need that money to settle its obligations if the currency is stable. State and local governments do, right? Like I said. But taxes have more of a societal impact than a budgetary impact. For example, they can discourage negative behavior or encourage positive behavior, alleviate the concentration of wealth in a few hands that have the ability to sway the political process. More importantly, where managing the economy is concerned, there's a limit to what we can accumulate as citizens, but it has less to do with the federal debt than it does with the one thing that can derail an entire economy, inflation. So I don't want to minimize the impact of inflation, right? We're going through a pretty tough period right now. And I'm not suggesting that a sovereign currency nation doesn't need a revenue source from its citizens. If we're all awash in cash and every single citizen had an insane amount of disposable income, we could go hog wild and throw an economy into disarray. But if we look at the period after the dual oil crisis and Nixon's currency shock, beginning with Ronald Reagan, we ran small to staggering deficits. Only under Bill Clinton did we balance the budget for a brief period, which led to a recession, by the way. But for 40 plus years, from Reagan through Biden, we blew up the federal debt by running deficits. And through it all, we had six recessions, nine technical stock market crashes, and we still had an average of 3.8% inflation, which includes the last two years. So the takeaway here is that in a sovereign currency nation with an economy the size of the United States, deficits do not correlate in any way to inflation. Now, a convenient talking point among Republicans is that deficits are designed to give money away to undeserving Americans, the non-job creators. And when they have too much money, they spend recklessly on drugs, alcohol, restaurants, and big screen televisions. Giving money away to the wealthy job creators, on the other hand, stimulates growth in the economy and leads to hiring, something also disproven by the facts and history. When you give tax breaks to the wealthy, which leads to budget deficits, they just hoard it. If you run a deficit by pouring money into the military industrial complex, it creates more shareholder value than it does jobs. But here's the important part outside of your preferred ideological view. Making the rich richer and making the military bigger doesn't change the price of bread. Whether you're giving money away to the rich or the poor, the concept of deficits and inflation simply aren't correlated. So once again, the proper and inevitable question is, why do we even collect taxes? So here's an unpopular progressive opinion. I don't care if the rich are taxed or not taxed. For practical economic purposes, it does not matter because the government doesn't need the money because they make the money. Do I think they should be taxed at a higher progressive rate? Yes, because it helps level the playing field and it reduces tension that comes from inequality. We can't turn into a nation of servants to the wealthy. But I do think taxes need to be levied somewhere else. So take in this reversal of logic for a second, right? The more you allow corporations to hoard cash, the less incentive they have to innovate and take risks. It's the opposite of whatever you've been told. But more than that, it works hand in hand with the fact that we've allowed for a system where the wealthy can simply purchase political power and legislation. That's the most unhealthy aspect of allowing such preposterous accumulation of wealth. But to be clear, with respect to MMT, taxing the wealthy individuals doesn't change anything in terms of our ability to run the country, 
settle transactions and debt obligations, and take care of the poor and the working class in the country. That's why I don't really like the whole tax the rich stance. It's counterproductive and it's counterintuitive. First of all, this idea just will never fly in America for the sole reason that each and every one of us carries within us a fantasy or a belief that we too will one day be wealthy and that it's a uniquely American right to possess it, flaunt it, and roll around in it. Dude. So I think we should stop focusing on the rich people and look at the mechanisms of wealth that they leverage. Where taxation matters more, in my humble opinion, is on large and multinational corporations. If we can't get the money out of politics, then take the money away from the entities that produce wealth and close down the provisions that enable them to hide it offshore. This is part of my overall thesis that you'll likely hear over and over again. The only way to reclaim any semblance of our democracy and create a system that works for everyone is to attack the oligarchy. Taxing corporations at a higher level does a couple of things. One is that it incentivizes higher compensation because companies would rather pay people than the government. Two, it also allows us to impact behavior and incentivize healthier and more productive outcomes. And three, it encourages research and development, which helps foster a culture of innovation. If you know as a company that your profits are being taxed at a higher rate, then you'll want to increase your piece of the pie. And the only way to do that is to keep that money working for you in-house. And the way to do that is through R&D. This isn't a groundbreaking concept, mind you. It's literally how we built the United States during the greatest period of innovation and economic development after World War II. All right, so let's talk about that other big talking point. Won't we saddle future generations with massive debt that they can't get out from under? All right, so again, I totally understand the sentiment. Nobody wants to saddle future generations with any of our BS. But this particular aspect is just not a thing because guess what? We have the money to retire all of the debt, either by stopping production of treasuries into the markets over time or by simply pressing a button at the Federal Reserve and wiping it out, just wiping it off the balance sheet. It seems really stupid, I know, but remember, these are just accounting mechanisms, moving balances from one side of our ledger to the other. It's actually not real. Not to mention, we're nowhere even close to the indebtedness of other currency sovereign nations like Japan, for example, and we've covered that before as well. Sovereign currency nations around the world are awakening to the reality that modern monetary theory is real. Canada is finally beginning to have these discussions. Japan and China already know what's up. The UK is going kind of in the opposite direction because they're still recovering from the Brexit hangover. But remember, MMT cannot be carried out by every nation. For all the talk of American exceptionalism, this might be one of the truest examples. We run the most extraordinary economy in the world. I cannot overstate this. We are the world economy. We can't run out of money because we are money. Will it always be this way? Nothing lasts forever. But we're not at the end of empire, no matter what anyone says. So again, this is not a critique on the way that we conduct ourselves as the world's dominant superpower. It's simply an acknowledgement of our economic status and a reflection of what's possible. All global debt is settled in US dollars. The value of money is steeped in perception, nothing else. Our size and reputation is the value of currency. And so the lesson here is that if we can fund endless war, if we can allow corporations to pay little to no taxes, if we can create more billionaires than any other nation on the planet, then we have the capacity to guarantee healthcare as a human right. Make sure that every child has a roof over their head and a full stomach. Free public education and so much more. I promise you, the return on investment on our people is so much greater than war and keeping score by how many billionaires you churn out. Oh, listen, one more thing. It, it just, it'll just take a second. Remember, for Book Love, the book is The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton. And I await your questions and responses in the comments section. And please remember to like and subscribe to the channel and check out our podcast. Go to unftr.com for all the details on how to listen to the show and how to support us. Here ended the lesson.